Hey guys, uh, we were having some issues with our Collaborate session this week, so we cut it a little bit short, but I did want to give you guys some things to think about as we uh, uh, as we go forward this week. So let me just hit you with a couple of questions that you might want to think about as we uh, proceed. First off, <clears throat> whenever we this cut out, one of the things I was asking you guys was uh, we were comparing Neil Postman's concept of uh, text-based society and a broadcast-based society and what the difference is there. Postman basically, uh, in his book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, which is a great read, um, traced the differences uh, in society as we went from a society that was mostly oriented around books and the written word to a society that's more broadcast oriented. A um, couple of things that he, he uh, talked about was, for example, in a text-based society, the original Lincoln-Douglas debates basically went like this. <clears throat> Imagine going to a uh, presidential debate where you had two candidates. One stood up, gave an hour and a half to two hour speech where he outlined all of his points and what he was going to do. Then you had a small break, everyone went home, got dinner, came back afterwards, and you had two more hours where the other person got up and addressed his debate. And then you may have another 30 minutes where that first person then rebutted it. So you're talking about literally hours and hours and hours of discourse here. Nowadays, who would stand for such a thing? Postman says this is the difference between uh, a text-based culture and a broadcast-based culture where one is much more instant gratification than the other is. One realizes, and this goes back to this idea of uh, William Schramm, this fraction of selection. Uh, this is what we were talking about in the Collaborate session. This idea that the expected reward is worth the, uh, the effort required to get it. In this case, the reward is becoming a well-informed citizen, and to be a well-informed citizen, the requirement is to do this, to take part in this civil function. Today, to be well-informed, you have to watch CNN for 15 minutes every, uh, every day, or, you know, tune in to, you know, local radio station, surf the, the web, yeah, the, effort required to call yourself a well-informed citizen is so minute that that's all that, that most people are willing to give. If that's the expectation, that's what people are willing to do. Put it a different way. Here's a question for you. What defines, say, technological um, affinity? The narrative these days is that millennial generations are very, or the millennial generation is very, very tech savvy. But a good chunk of the research is just anecdotal that says the millennial generation was raised on, or raised playing on cell phones with more operating power than the initial space capsules from the time they were two years old. Does that say something about the technology, or does that say something about the user, or both? These are questions that we might want to think about here. Does it show that they know really how to deal with complex technology, or has the technology just become so user-friendly that a two-year-old can use it? Two ways of looking at the same particular coin. So that's something to think about. Your book handles that in page uh, 200 through, well, really about 205 if you're in... Uh, the seventh, the, the seventh edition. Another thing, you really want to pay attention to this idea of uses and gratifications. Uses and gratifications is something that a lot of students glom onto. It's a huge theory. It's gigantic. And there's tons and tons of little mini theories underneath it. Um, but the general idea of uses and gratifications, the overarching idea of uses and gratifications, is that in a limited effects model of media, in a model where the media is not all-powerful and where we as 
consumers have a significant effect on basically our consumption patterns. Um, we seek out media that provides either some form of useful aspect to our lives or that gratifies us in some way, shape, or form. Let me not use the terminology of the theory here. We seek out media <clears throat> that we know how to apply into our lives in some meaningful way. This is use, uh, information that is useful for, or this is uh, media that is useful for informing us, educating us, entertaining us. This is information that gratifies us by, uh, again, making us inf uh, informed members of society, making us more educated than the person next to us, <sighs> supporting preconceived notions of the world. So again, if we already assume that the world is a certain way, it may gratify us by supporting that view of the world. For example, uh, there is a theory called the angry world theory. This basically goes in and says, um, that the more a person watches or consumes news, the more paranoid and pessimistic, really, a person will become. This basically comes down to, we see a news story about a murder. We go, hmm, the world seems pretty bad. And then we become primed to look for these things. Then we start noticing them. Think about it like this. If you bought a new car, how quickly is it uh, before you start noticing your car all over the place? We've probably all had this situation. We buy a hat, we buy a car, we buy a piece of clothing, we buy a new toy, and then we start noticing it everywhere. Okay? We prime ourselves to see this thing, and then we start seeing it everywhere. And the more we see, the more we actually notice. And it goes on and on and on like this. So uh, in uses and gratifications, this actually assumes that we as human beings want our preconceived notions gratified. Or I'm sorry, preconceived notions supported. We find gratification in this. And therefore, it's kind of a self-propelling or self-fulfilling prophecy here. Uh, so we seek out media that supports us in that way. We find it useful or we find it gratifying, thus uses and gratifications. Um, you'll also see a term in there that I think would be really fun, uh, really important to you called narcotizing dysfunction. Narcotizing like a narcotic dysfunction, well, you become so narcotized that you become dysfunctional. This is the idea that you just sort of become dead to what you're seeing. Um, you could call it uh, becoming desensitized, um, but it's more or less the same sort of concept. So, uses and gratifications, a giant theory that you're going to want to know about. Let's jump forward. I want to talk about entertainment theory. Entertainment theory is something that is very interesting, not because uh, it's just fun to talk about entertainment, but because entertainment is what I like to refer to as a second-level term. And what I mean by second-level term is this. We find something entertaining when it supports us uh, or affects us uh, on some psychological level. Okay? It makes us laugh. It makes us cry. It makes us angry. It makes us sad. Um... It makes us nostalgic. Uh, it, there's some sort of emotional payoff, and that emotional payoff, whatever that emotional payoff is, if we find this pleasing, we call that entertainment. Now, <clears throat> entertainment theory basically goes in and says, if we like an experience, if we experience something and we say, I kind of dig this for whatever reason, we as human beings have a tendency to want to reproduce that experience. Now, if any of you guys are C.S. Lewis fans, you'll know that he actually talks about this exact same thing in his, uh, his book, uh, Paralandra, um, as basically the human desire to 
uh, to seek out the same good multiple times over and over and over again, often to our detriment. You think about it like this. <clears throat> we may like a game that gives us kind of a psychological rush by being a hero shooting up the bad guys. Okay, so we try and seek out that rush again by going to another game that lets us shoot up the bad guys and another game that shoot up the bad guy. And sooner or later, we do become desensitized. We hit that narcotizing dysfunction. Over and over, we're experiencing this, and we become desensitized to this. We seek out more, and we seek out more, and we seek out more. And uh, it's a hedonistic sort of uh, motivation. But we want that same entertainment. It helps us manage our internal psychological stability. Um, your book refers to this as mood management theory, something that you might want to take a look at as well. We also have the ability in some cases to form false relationships with characters in entertainment medium, characters that we identify with, characters that we would like to form relationships with. Uh, in some cases we have the ability to form what are called parasocial relationships. Parasocial relationships <clears throat> are under the major theory of identification theory, and underneath that, one of those theories is parasocial relationships. Identification says that we have a tendency to identify with characters that we see in, in mass communication. Underneath that, there's a ton of smaller theories. One of those is parasocial relationships. Your book talks about it in page 214. One of the ways that we do identify is sometimes forming false relationships, is the best way I can put this, uh, with these characters. Let me give you an example. When you become actively involved in whether or not a false character or a fictional character succeeds or fails, you, their successes are your successes. Their failures are your failures. If someone betrays them, you are actively mad at that other person. Okay? If you've ever been there, you're experiencing some level of parasocial relationship with that character. In the same way that if someone insulted your brother, your sister, your best friend, you'd feel a similar thing. It's an amazing thing that happens between us and these characters if we experience... Um, their lives through entertainment over and over and over again. People first saw this in soap operas and how people related to that. So it's something you may want to pick, uh, look at. Uh, by the way, if you have Dr. Madison in any of your classes, he would love to chat with you about parasocial relationships. So, something to take a look at. Uh, I'd like to jump to chapter 8 very quickly. <clears throat> I want to hit the high points here. Schemas and social scripts. Schemas and social scripts. Schema theory basically says this, that through the media, social roles are defined. Um, your book says information processing theory arguing that memories and new uh, con uh, constructions Constructed from bits and pieces of connected experiences applied to meaning uh, making as situations demand. What does that mean? This means that we somehow in our brain have some sort of concept of how things not are, but should be. Okay? For example, you may have grown up in a middle class white neighborhood. Uh, but if you've got, well, with very few African Americans anywhere around, but if you've got some sort of idea about how urban black culture is, then you have some schemas, some social scripts working in your head that tell you this is how that culture ought to be if I were to ever encounter them. True, false, that has nothing to do with it. It's the fact that we have been programmed to have these constructs in our head, and, uh, <clears throat> and we generalize that. 
in many cases, this goes back to this idea of uh, of this uh, of Schramm's uh, excuse me of Postman's concept and Schramm's concept of uh, of uh, trying to balance out reward and effort. Here, what we're trying to say is instead of feeling that uncomfortableness of admitting that I have no idea what to expect, we fill in the holes with things that we have seen, heard, assume from media. Okay, It's no different than if, say, Aunt June told you this was what she saw or thought about such and such, and you just assumed it were to, uh, it were to be true, except the media speaks with a much louder voice and much more authority in most cases. We see we see movies about, uh, say, urban black culture, and we assume that is the truth. A uh, person watches lots of pornography and expects that's what sex is like. That's what women tr secretly want. Um, heck, flip that around. Maybe a woman sees lots and lots of TV shows and commercials that show guys as lazy, slovenly buffoons and assumes that men, huh? Go figure. These are all social scripts and social schemas. There's a ton of those, and that is a huge research area that you might want to pick up. Just something to think about. Uh, your book does a really great job in that. Um, in that, you would also want to take a look at the el elaboration likelihood model. This basically governs human beings' ability to elaborate, to explore those schemas, to seek out more information than what we just assume to be true, uh, and what different areas or what different elements play into that likelihood. Uh, heuristics. This is a very sticky um, concept, but a heuristic very simply is how a person learns for themselves about something. Trial and error is one of the most common processes in a heuristic model of education. Uh, let's see if there's anything else you really need to know here. I think that jumps us to chapter 9. The biggest thing in chapter 9, there's two gigantic things in chapter 9 that you absolutely positively have to get, okay? The first, as I said in your overview, is agenda setting. You absolutely positively have to get this. Agenda setting, I know I'm going long here, but I hope you're still with me. Agenda setting is this. The media essentially does not tell us uh, what to think but what to think about. And if I could add something to this, it tells us in what terms to think about it. Okay, let me rephrase that in a way that may make more sense. The media does not tell us what to think, dot, 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 but what to think about and in what terms. Okay, so for example, <clears throat> let's build on all of the things we've talked about. People are essentially cognitive misers. They want information uh, as quickly and easily as they can get it. Okay? They have social schemas in their brains. They already have assumptions about the world. They know what is right. They know what is wrong. They already know how people are and ought to be. They've already got these things in their brains. The media, being limited on time, on space, can only legitimately cover so much of a particular issue, like, say, abortion. Let's just throw that out. And so, in an attempt to, quote-unquote, be fair, the media may go in and say, we want to cover, quote, both sides of the issue. How many sides are there to abortion? Well, we deal in dichotomies, so we want to cover pro-life, and pro-choice. That's it. Now, from a media perspective, the news director might say, well, look, these are the two 
extreme competing sides and everyone else feel, fits in between this. From an audience perspective, this creates, and research has shown this, this creates the perception that if you're not strong pro-life or strong pro-choice, that there's something wrong with you if you're in the middle there. That somehow you're not part of major group A or major group B, that you are by yourself out in the wilderness and that you're a weirdo out here, when in reality, nothing could be more uh, far or farther from the truth. And that's where that concept of spiral of silence that your book also talks, in, uh, talks about comes in. You assume that because the media says pro-life versus pro-choice, and you go, but I'm kind of in the gray area here, but since I'm not right here and right here, I guess I better just sort of be quiet, not say anything. You assume that's the case, and many people just kind of withdraw back and don't say anything or feel like they have to identify with one or the other side of this. Um, so the media doesn't tell us what to think, but it says, here's what to think about. Abortion. And in what terms? Pro-life versus pro-choice. <laughs> okay. And if you don't fit into any, either one of those categories, what often happens is that all those people in the middle, which represents about 70 to 80 percent of most situations, kind of fall, fall back. The silent majority that thinks it's the minority falls back and becomes quiet in society. Or, through priming, which is another term you need, priming, uh, through priming what ends up happening is you're, assume, uh, is you're raised to assume that the best thing you can do is even if you don't feel it, even if you don't believe it, you've got to go with one group or the other and just fall in line, which is also very destructive to our political and social process. So you're primed to do this, that, or the other uh, through this process. Now, I'm hitting the high points here. Your book does a good job, but I'm hope, hoping that this may help you out. Um, so, I think I've hit most of this. I hope that you guys have gotten through some of this. And, uh, yeah. I hope this helps. And if not, well, we gave it the old college try. If you need any more help or you'd like to discuss this anymore, I'd love to talk with you. If you want to swing by the office, if you want to set up a phone call, that's great. Uh, if you want to Skype, I'm all for it. Just let me know. Otherwise, hope to talk to you soon.